So our meeting today is being organized as part of the uh, United Nations High Level Political Forum on uh, sustain, uh, Sustainable Development, which is an event taking place every year for uh, countries to come to the United Nations and share progress being made uh, towards uh, achieving the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, to any challenges on the way, lessons learned, uh, and uh, monitoring progress annually towards uh, achieving these goals. Uh, this year, it's running on the theme of sustainable and resilient recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic that promotes economic, social, and environmental di dimensions of sustainable development, building an inclusive and effective path for the achievement of the 2030 Agenda in the context of the Decade of Action for Delivery for Sustainable Development. This Decade of Action uh, started already last year, which is a push by uh, member states of the United Nations to make sure that the final 10 years uh, really maximize opportunities for achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. Once that push was uh, began, uh, it, it actually began just before COVID, uh, COVID-19 hit the world in uh, 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 almost uh, just over a year now. And uh, it has unfortunately reversed a lot of the gains that was already being made to a sustainable development. So it's even more necessary now to find ways of uh, promoting and pushing and supporting an uh, international collaboration in order to achieve sustainable development by uh, 2030. The Secretary General of the United Nations has called for a new social contract, which includes investment in people, investment in planet, reduction of inequality within and between countries as a key element for achieving sustainable development. So in our um, uh, meeting today, we'll be having some examples from uh, cooperatives around the world, and other actors who are working towards sustainable development. And uh, we'll also be having uh, presentations from institutional partners uh, uh, in, in this uh, development agenda. So uh, without further ado, I want to give the floor to our first speaker. And our first speaker is Ms. Marlene Holzner, who heads uh, the unit for local authorities, civil society organization and foundations, Directorate General for International Partnerships at the European Commission. Mm. Ms. Holmes, now you have five minutes to make your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm very happy to join you today in this event at the High Level Political Forum, um, and especially that I can discuss with you the topic rebuild better together because i think there we have a, a, a common topic uh that is one of the most important ones uh that we have to discuss today we all know how disastrous uh the pandemic has been for uh all of us and especially for our partner countries and in all this and how to rebuild and how to make, I think there's also a little bit of hope inside that we rebuilt it better than it was. And many, many things and problems and challenges we faced um, that we can address by rebuilding it the good way. From the European Union side of you, what do I mean or what we do mean uh, as building better? I just want to throw on you some of the keywords. Uh, for us, it must be sustainable, green, digital, circular, inclusive, and just. So it's a huge, huge package. And in effect, what we want to tackle are many, many things at the same time. Uh, the global poverty, the inequalities, climate change, biodiversity loss, and also environmental degradation. Huh? So in this kind of new challenge and new, I think, hopeful way of looking at this, we think that the cooperatives, they have a very important role to play in this and to addressing for and foremost the, the social economic fallout of the COVID crisis. Huh? 
because what we have seen is that you have really a proven stable record of stable employment, even in times if there's an economic downturn, many, many companies have been wiped out. But we do see that the cooperatives are much more stable than the others are. And uh, yes, they are very, very small cooperatives. But if we are taking it together, you know, um, the employment you actually creating and you know also keeping in terms of numbers is huge. In 2018, I read that 9.46% of the world's employed population is working within a cooperative. So we're talking about roughly 300 million um, jobs that you created. And why this is so, I think that's also very, very clear. It is because the cooperatives, they have the very, very own structure. It's not a uh, company which is as a stock exchange, it is, you know, somehow maybe led by somebody else, a manager, and then off it goes with the wind. Yours is an ownership and democratic control led kind of organizations. And these are by themselves, you know, um, are more stable and resilient because if you are the owner, if it's your own, of course, you will do everything to uh, keep it going and also make sure that all who are with you in the business model keep on going. So we see because of that, it's more resilient. And, and this is very, very important for the European uh, Union also advanced decent work. Because when we talk about sustainable growth, we want to create jobs which are good for people. We do not want to create economic growth for the matter of having economic growth or for the profits of the big uh, companies, but it must be a growth which will in turn then uh, create decent work. And there the cooperatives, as you're locally anchored and with your model infrastructure, as I said before, uh, we just know that you are doing it every single day and we hope that we can really help to have economic growth uh, with you so that it is really a decent worker. So in this sense, you help us also, you know, to reduce inequalities and really reach out to the poorest and the most marginalized population. This very typical or this very, um, very your kind of uh, structure, which you know only the cooperatives have. That was also one of the reasons why we, as the European Union, wanted to have a strategic partnership, a very special partnership with the cooperatives. And we have uh, established in 2016 a strategic uh, partnership with the International Cooperative Alliance. And what does it mean? It means that we have really said we do not want only to do one a project here and a project there, and then after two years it's gone. No, we wanted to enter in a more longer term perspective uh, and also see where we as European Union can help the International Cooperatives Alliance also financially to contribute so that the strategic aims, which are, as I said, as I said before, the same for the European Union that we can help you to achieve them and so also helping us to achieve our goals. Huh? So we have chosen this um, international um, cooperative alliance because our aim are international. And within this partnership, we have also seen that there are some actions we can do together, which is very much in, in, in our interest as well. One is that they supported their own regional and inside national networks so that the capacity of the cooperatives will be strengthened because we know we have to go down really to the level of the country and even be lower to make a difference on the ground. Huh? And then they have also done centrally work, which uh, we thought is important for pushing the whole cooperatives movement. And one of these examples was 
that they did research on uh, what the legislation said in cooperatives, because uh, the alliance said that it's very different. In some countries, cooperatives are allowed, in others it's more difficult, and we all know that the legal framework, if for whatever reason, for, for taxes, for getting also funding from us, international um, development actors, the funding is in the legal framework is important. So they did this study on say where uh, it's easy, where and the situation differs. And from that point onwards, of course, with advocacy and, and so on, and also with our help, we can try to improve uh, the situation where it's not the way we want to have it. Huh? Now, of course, uh, with the financial assistance we gave, it was also uh, to uh, increase the skills and uh, help other stakeholders on the ground to just move on. Uh, I just want to finish with a um, very general kind of, um, I would say, our um, the way we see cooperatives in very general, the European Union has um, produced many strategic documents. And one is the European Consensus on Development, which also said that we recognize and see that the value of the cooperatives in contributing sustainable development, achieving all the SDGs, and as I said before, the creation of these jobs. And the new legal base we have for all the money we spend as aid also says that, and, and, and says that, you know, cooperatives are a way of promoting social, economic, and environmental resilience, huh? and help us to eradicate poverty and reducing the inequalities. Then what also is an argument in favor of cooperatives is that we would like to go also uh, there and help small and medium-sized companies, especially in Africa. And here we have the, the I would say, the big challenges that, of course, the funds we have are uh, big contracts, but the small and medium-sized companies, we do know uh, maybe they, they need... Uh, smaller amounts that we normally spend. So having uh, the cooperatives and also the international cooperative alliance is also something, a kind of vehicle where we say, okay, there we can look at how we support uh, young entrepreneurs and uh, do the concretely by the cooperatives. Huh? And I do remember, uh, like to recall to you that um, there was also an event uh, investing in young business in Africa where our commissioner was there and mentioned also the cooperatives. In terms of the future, what we will um, do in the next seven years, we have a new financial program and we start you know, to plan how to uh, spend the money. Um, of course, as this is something where we plan at the moment, I cannot say to what extent, you know, cooperatives will continue to get financial assistance, but I can just say uh, that uh, we, uh, we will do our utmost to keep you on board and uh, still work with you because we do believe, as I said before, that for all these reasons, you know, uh, you are one of the very important partners for us. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Ms. Holzner, for your keynote address, and thank you for your continuing strong support for cooperatives and your strategic vision that matches uh, the promotion, uh, the uh, good, decent work, the promotion of uh, small, medium-sized enterprises, and uh, I do hope that in, uh, you know, in the forthcoming financial considerations, cooperatives will remain front center of that as cooperatives are really the key engines for promoting sustainable development. So thank you very much, Ms. Holzer. And uh, now we'll give the floor. Uh, we are going to Mongolia. Mongolia is one of the strong supporters of cooperatives at the United Nations. And they were all, always the country that's moving the resolution, uh, resolution and supporting the negotiations amongst member states to come up with agreements on ways to support uh, cooperatives. So we have uh, Mr. Yaram Surin, who is uh, uh, the um, works for the uh, is the head of the government agency 
for small and medium-sized enterprises in Mongolia, which includes cooperatives. It's now almost eight o'clock at night for you, so I'm sure you're eager to go. Please have the floor. I'm sorry, I cannot hear you. Can we can we hear Mr. Yaram Oh, Maybe sorry. No. Okay, yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, now I can. Sorry. Uh, hello, everyone. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of all cooperatives in Mongolia and on my own, I would like to extend my greetings and thank the UNDSA and the committee for the promotion and advancement of cooperatives for the invitation to participate in this side event organized within the high level political forum on sustainable development. Today is the national holiday NATO in Mongolia. This year, we celebrated multiple anniversaries such as the 815 years of the founding of the Great Mongol Empire, the 100 years of the People's Revolution as well as the 60 years of Mongolia's full fledged membership in the UN. It's my pleasure to participate in this timely and important side event as a representative of Mongolia, main sponsor of the GA resolution entitled Cooperatives in Social De Development. At the outside, allow me to share Mongolia's experience, namely the policy measures taken by the parliament and government of Mongolia to support the cooperative movement during the COVID-19 pandemic as well as the activities to increase the role of cooperatives in achieving the sustainable development goals. The International Cooperative Alliance has been celebrating International Cooperative Day since 1923, proclaimed by the United Nations, Nations General Assembly in its resolution 4719, 75, 95. The International Day, Day of Cooperatives celebrated annually aims at putting the cooperative sector around the world in the spotlight and to promote the cooperative's role in social life. Mongolia celebrated the International Day of Cooperatives 2021 under the theme of Rebuild Better Together to promote how cooperatives are overcoming the global pandemic with solidarity, resilience, and joint efforts. Mongolia's first cooperative was founded in 1921 as the People's Mutual Aid Cooperative. Among its first 116 members were the then ruler of the country, Bokhtang and his queen. As of 2020, the country has registered 4,468 operating cooperatives with about 235,000 members, most of which are 3,670 cooperatives are operating in rural areas, and most of their active members are herders. In particular, herders and farmers work together to improve their livelihoods and make a significant contribution to local development. Today, on the eve of the 100th anniversary of the development of the cooperative sector in Mongolia, the parliament has amended the law on cooperatives and approved resolution number 40 on measures to be taken in relation to be to the passed law. In particular, the resolution declares 2022 as the year of cooperative development to intensify the cooperative movement. The amended law on cooperatives regulates important economic 
interactions for cooperatives, such as loans from financial institutions, attracting investment, ownership and disposal of assets. The cooperatives are now required to distribute income to its members, as well as carry out all activities within the scope of the law. It also redefined the rights and responsibilities of cooperatives and their members, as well as the functions of the state. One of the biggest public supports for cooperatives is the creation by amended law of the Cooperative Development Fund. Moreover, cooperatives that present sufficient documentation to clarify their assets may have increased access to loans from financial institutions. The cooperatives are also required to establish a contingency fund, which is the basis for the cooperative sustainable existence and to protect themselves from financial risks. According to the law of amendments to the value-added tax law of Mongolia, the income from the in intermediary sales to sales of cooperative goods to local producers is exempt from what? We believe that as the result of these measures, the social value of cooperatives will increase. The coordination of organizations supporting cooperatives will enhance. The next generation of cooperatives will be prepared. Unemployment will reduce. The food supply will improve. And local jobs will be created to enable citizens to live and work in local settings. Furthermore, the world is rapidly adapting to digital transformation. At this time, digit digitalization of the agriculture sector will not only have a direct impact on improving product competitiveness, expanding markets, and ensuring food security, but also on development, developing agriculture as an independent sector of economy. Hence, the role of cooperatives is crucial. On the other hand, due to the digitalization of agriculture in conjunction with the agricultural commodity exchange reform, cooperatives are expected to, the, to play a key role in agricultural commodity exchanges and raw material supply which creates a number of advantages for co cooperatives. In conclusion, on behalf of all cooperatives of Mongolia, I wish to call on countries to work together to overcome the pandemic and build a better world with a view to rebuild better together. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much for staying with us so late and thank you so much for your continuing support to cooperatives internationally through your leadership at the um, United Nations uh, on the uh, annual uh, general biennial general assembly resolution on cooperatives and social development. And it's also uh, <clears throat> very noteworthy that you have decided to declare uh, 2022 uh, the International Year for Cooperative Development. As you know, uh, I mean the Mongolian Year for Cooperative Development, sorry. I mean, as you know, uh, it's been 10 years now since we had the International Year for Cooperatives. And um, that the year, the International Year was very instrumental in supporting cooperative development internationally. And uh, it's also one of the issues that the uh, United Nations Secretary General is discussing in his forthcoming report on cooperatives and social development. So now, uh, thank you for taking the leadership nationally, uh, and I hope you'll uh, once again take the leadership internationally in uh, seeking an, another uh, year for cooperative development. So thank you very much. Now uh, I will turn to our institutional partners in COPAC, 
who are going to make uh, some presentations on their work uh, uh, for cooperatives. And I will start with uh, Anna Biondi, who is going to be uh, who is the deputy director for the International Labour Organization Bureau for Workers Activities, who will start us off on this section of institutional partners. So please, Ms. Biondi, you have the floor. Thank you so much, uh, Andrew, and uh, um, good day to all the participants. And uh, um, I must say that I'm very honored uh, to represent ILO in this uh, uh, gathering, and especially because, uh, you know, as members of COPAC, but also, you know, since uh, several colleagues were mentioning uh, where we come from, you know, indeed, uh, let me remind that uh, to the uh, uh, ILO, in the ILO um, established in 1990, immediately afterwards the cooperative service in 1920 came along and so this is certainly a foundation of the world of work a foundation that you you have asked us to reflect also how the impact of COVID-19 has had a toll for all in this past year and unfortunately still continuing certainly we had all to change our way of work. The ILO uh, conducted its first uh, virtual uh, international labor conference, but we all had uh, to look at how to support the world of work, the workers in needs of needing protection, uh, in, uh, very much in cooperatives. And as many of you have already said, in, in deciding which are the new paths, uh, which sometimes are the old paths also, in order to create more sustainable and resilient uh, societies. This year, uh, indeed, in the virtual conference, we discussed a global call to action uh, to respond to the COVID-19, and we uh, again uh, mm, uh, uh, pointed to the interdependence of all members of society and to the sectors that had been particularly affected. I will be um, very interested in listening also to the colleagues that will speak afterwards and uh, speaking about the specific uh, um, uh, situation. I must say that this is really during period of crisis that the value of cooperation, solidarity is valued. And certainly the cooperative, the mutuals, the association, the social enterprises have given interesting examples during this period. I'm thinking of the shortening of the supply chain, the securing food and essential goods and services, the shifting production to protect equipment, uh, the distribution of this protective equipment uh, to those most in need, uh, the creation also of uh, uh, fundraising for COVID release efforts. In general, you know, in this uh, um, um, to, um, to, tools uh, towards uh, a new operation, towards innovation and uh, informalization of the informal economy, we need to link certain aspects that were coming also to, from the ILO uh, reflection. I would say certainly uh, for uh, um, contributing to the human centering approach, uh, maintaining the fundamental rights, uh, health and safety, as I was saying, that has become uh, very much prominent, but also the link to the universal social protection. It is clear that once we have cooperative, especially small cooperatives, uh, that they cannot afford uh, uh, you know, a proper protection for all the workers, we need to have uh, uh, a basic social floor for all the workers in a country. And so this is why cooperatives need very much to be part of the social dialogue uh, at national level uh, for discussing national employment strategies, to discuss trade, uh, environmental issues, as it was said before, but also uh, finance and national development plans. Uh, uh, before it has already been mentioned, also the circular economy, I really believe that uh, cooperatives can uh, strongly uh, support uh, all these goals. Um, Everybody is in agreement here. Somebody was also asking already in the chat about uh, uh, that the cooperatives are the major drive in order to reduce inequalities and also because of their link to communities, to the drive towards decent work, but also democracy. Indeed, the democratically owned and controlled, uh, you know, uh, service 
addressing the members' uh, needs, but also the community. I think these are uh, uh, elements that we all want to uh, emphasize. Um, what, uh, you know, I spoke about uh, the past, uh, the, the far past, but I must say that uh, indeed, you know, just like this uh, number two comes back because uh, next year it will be 20 years from the uh, adoption of Recommendation 193 on cooperative of the ILO that remains uh, the strong pillars, including uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, definitions and including in terms of uh, you know, uh, giving uh, uh, the legal uh, definition of, uh, of cooperatives. But in these 20 years, indeed, uh, it was already mentioned by you, Andrew, the fact that uh, in uh, 2012, the UN had uh, the year of cooperatives. And next year, you know, actually the ILO will have again in the International Labor Conference a discussion on uh, social and solidarity economy. I would say that is very important I hope that, uh, you know, all this group will be part of that reflection. And again, this is not in lieu of the recommendation. This discussion is not creating something else, but actually in order to strengthen uh, the importance of the cooperatives. Of course, cooperatives are not uh, the wonderful world where everything is, uh, is perfect. You know, it's like we know that uh, sometimes cooperatives has been used to establish soon cooperatives in order to deny labor rights or uh, you know also somebody wants to transform the cooperatives into simple uh, enterprises a private business and and instead you know uh, I think we need to continue to emphasize the added value of the social dimension and the community dimension but uh, all of this is to say that certainly the ILO want to be uh, on the side of co cooperatives working together. And I really believe that, uh, you know, if we want to rethink, uh, uh, you know, new models uh, that are uh, economic and social models, uh, cooperatives uh, are certainly at the center of this reflection. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Anna Piondi. Um, and thank you also to ILO for your continuing work on supporting cooperatives and uh, for bringing us recommendation 193 and uh, to, 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 to note that you're going to continue this uh, discussions next year as well. And uh, co uh, ILO's leadership also in the issue of universal social protection has, uh, you know, you have made this discussion mainstream. You have made the discussion uh, take and, and by particularly showing that you don't have to be a rich country to be able to provide social protection to your people. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, so from then I will move on to Mr. Uh, GM Brady, uh, head of the unit for family farming engagement and parliament, uh, parliamentary networks within the food and agricultural organization. Uh, five minutes, please, Bra Mr. Brady, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Andrew. Uh, on behalf of FAO, I would like to thank for this opportunity. My greetings to COPAC colleagues, member states, representatives, and cooperative members that are following this debate with us. I well, would like to bring some, some reflections on the cooperatives' contributions for just recovery on the food security dimension and for more sustainable food systems. I think the COVID-19 crisis showed us the relevance of well-functioning cooperatives and well-linked to its territories and memberships and keeping coherence to the cooperative principles to cope with the crisis as uh, Anna well uh, uh, referred to at the end of her presentation. So the COVID-19 uh, crisis has impacted the agriculture sector caused uh, short-term cash flow uh, shortages to farmers and businesses, diminished operating capacities with negative effects on employment and incomes. And this raises, raises questions on how robust uh, our socioeconomic system uh, is to shocks and uh, stress the urgency of addressing agri-food systems with a complex set of interventions that goes beyond production. Right. This was already valid uh, before the pandemic, and uh, it, it is uh, even more needed now. Uh, indeed, when it comes to small-scale family-based food producers, it is even more evident that COVID-19 exacerbated 
already existing structural weaknesses and inequalities of food systems, bringing additional uh, uh, challenges to already existing problems. So uh, reduce access, uh, access to markets due, due to movement restrictions, the issues of conservation of perishable products, uh, changing consumer uh, behaviors, the closure of farmer markets and other commercialization channels such as uh, schools and, and canteens, uh, the closure of small businesses in their neighboring areas lead, led to a reduction in the family's income and uh, could have challenged the farm's capacity and decision to continue producers. But we saw food producers and their cooperatives have been uh, acting as important catalyzers in developing local solutions and tackling structural transformations affecting their livelihoods. They created, created solidarity networks in realities with inadequate social protection schemes, supported effective implementation of protection uh, responses and, and crisis management measures, provided family farmers with relevant information to ensure that they were not exposed to or agents of transmission, and cooperatives and family farmers organizations developed also alternative logistics and food distribution initiatives directly linking producers and consumers. They applied new technologies, uh, in particular tools of e-commerce, for instance. They maximized access to reliable and remunerative uh, markets and advocated as well to, uh, for government's emergency responses, resource allocations and long-term policy changes. So beyond facing the immediate emergency, cooperatives and family farmers hold a unique position to contribute to an effective long-term response to the impacts of the pandemic. Family farmers are probably the majority of uh, agricultural cooperative members. They are also the majority of farm units in the world, around 90%. And cooperative have the potential to support them in continuously adapting and protecting traditional knowledge and in providing new innovative answers to the challenges that are that we are currently facing. Uh, based on that potential, uh, FAO is glad to be uh, leading the implementation of the United Nations Decade on Family Farming that goes from 2019 until 2028. Uh, mm -hmm. together with our uh, sister agency, IFAD, and we are promoting the cooperative sector as a key ally to respond to the current priority concerns on inequality, on uh, environmental requirements, social innovation and technology, health, etc. Uh, the United Nations Decade on Family Farming is fueling an extensive process of policy dialogue involving almost 1,600 stakeholders around a thousand family farmers organizations involved in and their cooperatives. Uh, more than 65 national committees on family farming has been established, functioning as multi-stakeholder platforms for policy dialogue. And cooperatives are well included in this effort and we need to continue to, to bring cooperatives into these national dialogues. Uh, we've been working with uh, 50 countries on the implementation of the United Nations Decade and glad to see that in almost uh, two years of implementation, nine countries already approved national action plans on family farming and we have other seven in final phase of adoption. We've noted the growth from the second part of 2019 uh, of national processes in different countries, leveraging building on the paramount role played by family farmers, their organizations and cooperatives in feeding their communities and, and the cities during the worst period of the pandemic. This recognition translated into a renewed commitment to incorporate into strategies, policies, and in the national action plans on family farming, the emergency measures, measures to address the repercussions of COVID, but also include family farmers and their organizations as key actors in the midterm uh, recovery strategies. This is well reflected, for instance, in the 85 laws, policies and regulations that were developed and approved in 2019 and 2020, most of which focusing on mitigating the impacts of COVID-19 on family farmers and on promoting family farming centered approaches to deal with food system issues. So under this umbrella and in the, in the framework of FAO's work with COPAC, uh, we will continue focusing on providing support at national level 
uh, to develop a positive enabling environment with appropriate and diversity of policies and legal frameworks to family farmers and their cooperatives to perform well, contributing to shape a recovery that puts people and their well being at the center. Thanks so much, Andrew. Thank you so much, Jim, uh, for, uh, for your support for family farmers and uh, all the other work you're doing. Hunger continues to be a problem in this world, and uh, COVID is making hunger worse. So for it's, it's essential to achieving the sustainable development that we have a world without hunger. So thank you very much, Rafael. Now, uh, we move on to um, our next presenter, who is going to be Nazik, uh, excuse me for the pronunciation, Bay Shenali, who is a uh, World Cooperative Congress Research Advisor and is speaking on behalf of the ICA. So, uh, Nazik, please, uh, you have five minutes. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. It's a huge privilege and honor to represent cooperatives and the International Cooperative Alliance on this important platform. Um, and today's uh, my presentation will be about the research which are, we are currently conducting on uh, cooperatives' contributions uh, to the SDGs. Cooperatives, uh, they represent a sustainable and participatory form of business by their very uh, nature as the seventh principle of the ICA state that cooperatives work for the sustainable development of their communities. Since 2015, the ICA has been committed to revealing and communicating and cooperatives' contribution to the SDGs. These efforts have clearly demonstrated that cooperatives contribute to every single goal as they represent a wide range of business sectors that cover a large variety of um, economic activities from health to finance, from agriculture to digital platforms. To structure cooperatives role in the SDG process, and more importantly, to offer ICA members a common framework for reporting on their activities, we undertook a study uh, that allowed us to look on how cooperatives integrate sustainability in their everyday practices. <clears throat> so we started by asking a question, what cooperatives do uh, to contribute to the SDGs and what factors would explain their contributions? We carefully scrutinized ICA members' website publications, their annual and sustainability reports uh, across different regions and sectors. Based on this, we are now uh, building a conceptual framework using the theory of change approach that allows revealing the causal linkages between cooperative business model, uh, their activities, and uh, their impact on sustainability. The results of the study will be presented at the ICA, to the ICA members at the uh, World Cooperative Congress at the end of this year, and we hope there, there, uh, there will be um, a cooperative intake of this initiative. So we have identified that in terms of reducing inequalities, cooperative practices could be represented by four main areas of their interlinked activities. First of all, it's about providing access. Cooperatives provide access to finance, healthcare services, education, food, housing, and many other, which are particularly important during these pandemic times. Um, secondly, um, they empower vulnerable communities. Cooperatives members, the um, member profile is often represented by the poor, youth, women, uh, minorities, refugees, disabled people, and other uh, groups who face challenges of lack of opportunity and exclusion and very severely hit by the COVID-19. They also create income generating activities. As it has been already said, they um, provide work opportunities for 10% of employed uh, world population, protecting their rights to decent work, formalizing the informal economy, fostering social entrepreneurship, promoting uh, sustainable value chains and fair trade. Cooperatives also allow communities to preserve and protect their environment by committing uh, to sustainability standards and certifications, by setting up forestry, renewable energy, waste management, and other types of cooperatives, while cooperatives banks support communities with sustainable finance. Cooperatives SDG contributions are enabled by their weight and number of their member community, their principle and values, strong and interconnected global network, their embeddedness in local economies, and their unique governance and business model. 
we could also see the importance of um, the external enabling factors, which are uh, very much linked to their partnerships. So uh, we can see the importance of policy support from COPAC, UNDESA, ILO, EU, that were key to mainstreaming cooperatives into the SDG process. To benefit uh, from cooperatives' potential to promote uh, um, sustainable development goals, uh, for us, it's important to continue supporting them, but um, at different levels. So first, cooperatives need to gain their specific place in the international development policies and programs as one of the key local development partners. <clears throat> um, in, in this regard, strengthening the role of umbrella organization is important because of the role of bridging policies with practices of social uh, of local communities is increasingly important. And here we have earlier spoken already about the success of COP for Deaf project, which was an important um, uh, example that could um, uh, demonstrate of the importance of this kind of partnerships. Second, it's crucially important to support governments for creating an enabling environment that will allow cooperatives to benefit from favorable legal status in accordance to the cooperatives principles and ensuring that developing cooperatives remain in the mandates of country's highest authorities. Third, further efforts are needed to overcome the lack of research, evidence, and statistics. The SDG process is indeed an occasion to sensitize cooperatives, but also national and international partners on the importance of building evidence-based knowledge on cooperatives. Fourth, there is a need for greater support to cooperative education, as they still have difficulties with integrating into the core of business and economic teaching. As a result, we still don't see them as an integral part of the business environment and sustainable development process. Cooperative model was developed as a natural self-help response to income inequalities. In the context of post-COVID recovery, their role is particularly important for the SDG 10, reducing inequalities, as they address gender, ethnicity, community, geography, and many other inequalities. Thank you very much for your attention. So we'll be happy to share um, the results of our research when they will be um, finalized. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nazi. Uh, the research you're conducting is of utmost importance. Um, some of the difficulties that uh, we find in promoting cooperatives is the lack of uh, internationally comparable data to show the extent to which they are contributing to sustainable development around the world. So I, for one, and I'm sure all of us are really looking forward to the results of your research. Thank you very much. Uh, now, finally, for this section, we're going to have Anne Chapaz, who is the Chief of Institutions and Ecosystems uh, Section of the International Trade Center. Anne, you have five minutes, please. Thank you very much. I'm going to try and uh, share my screen. So. Hopefully that will work for everyone. Okay. Uh, so thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Is it working all right, Andrew? I can see it all right. Thank you very much. Thank you. So just very quickly um, to complete this round of institutions to make sure you know who it is we are. Uh, International Trade Center is a joint agency and it's quite unique, a joint agency of the WTO and the United Nations. We're absolutely committed to the sustainable goals uh, and we do that by improving the competitiveness of small and medium sized businesses so that they can engage in uh, international value chains and benefit from sustainable and inclusive trade. We have an integrated approach. It means we work with policymakers, with small businesses themselves, and with this critical level of business support organizations. And this is where our work with cooperatives comes in in a dual way. Cooperatives are very important to us. There's such a great connection between the cooperative values and the way in which our values and ITC support the work we do. We absolutely agree from what, uh, what's been said already today that cooperatives have the ability to contribute to strong and inclusive value chains, and they've absolutely demonstrated their ability to be resilient to economic and social crises over the last year and a half. We also uh, strongly value the support role that cooperatives play for their members. Uh, we've heard already about the services and the solutions and the advocacy role that cooperatives can play. 
uh, and it has the same effect as our integrated model of creating long lasting systemic change at community, regional and national level. And for us at ITC, we're also, uh, we value highly the, po the potential that cooperatives have to create this multiplier effect. They provide the sustainable livelihoods, but also all those associated benefits uh, to the community, creating um, you know, a, a really significant change to the community as a whole. So what's interesting from our approach is because we work with businesses and with institutions, we see co-ops as this hybrid model where they act as uh, actors in a, in a global value chain, where they're involved in creating market linkages and branding, certification, packaging issues, but where they also have this really interesting role as what we call a business support organization, where they have to make sure they've got the right governance in place, where they're making good decisions, good record keeping, um, and involving their community um, and excellent communication. So because of this dual role, we think that, that co-ops have a really important role to play in the next decade and, uh, you know, a real chance to be a major actor in building a kind of a post-pandemic world. So at ITC, we really want to do all we can to make sure that they are as efficient and effective as possible. And this is where my team comes in, where, where we, have, we have unique expertise in building the performance of business support organizations, this institutional aspect of the what co-ops do. So in the last year or so, we have been adapting some of our assessment models and uh, to make them particularly relevant to co-ops. And we've been deploying these and testing them in a number of different locations. And as a result of that, we're also in the process of adapting all our capacity building tools uh, to um, support co-ops in the areas where they particularly need help. So our assessment tool covers these different areas of governance, vision, leadership, member engagement, partnerships, market activities, services, and measurements. And you can see here uh, that we've already uh, adapted many of our capacity building tools for some of these areas, and there are some more to come. We've learned some lessons along the way. Um, it's common strengths among the cops we've worked with. Fantastic to see the motivation among the members, particularly in the cooperatives uh, led and uh, managed for women. Um, there's usually good foundation governance mechanisms in place, particularly because of the, the bylaws. Great committed leadership, um, very purpose driven, and also the fact that they can benefit from the recognition and the credibility of this co-op model. On the flip side, there are some common weaknesses that we find, uh, limited communication and engagement with, um, with members, usually a lack of long-term vision and planning, um, sometimes a bit of low confidence in some of those core skills around negotiation and presentation, and generally um, not meeting the potential to make um, international market linkages. So this is what we at ITC are hoping to support co-ops to do. Um, we want to focus on what we think are our niche areas. We want to leverage on our strengths at ITC, which is to make sure that we are creating these market linkages and that we are helping um, the performance of these uh, co-ops to, to improve. We do this by calling on our partnerships, including ICA, ILO, and other members of COPAC. Uh, we want to focus on building their capacity as businesses. We want to focus on building their capacity as institutions. And we want to focus on helping um, support those market linkages. But above all, we recognize that the experts of co-ops are co-ops. So we want to do this really building um, locally up. We want to make sure that there's a focus on peer-to-peer -peer learning and knowledge exchange and on building the kind of trust that's required for great commercial linkages and commercial transactions between buyer co-ops and supplier co-ops in the future. We think that this knowledge exchange, these trusting relationships, this bridge building between co-ops and and actors in building resilient, sustainable, and inclusive value chains. 
So quick summary, um, cooperatives are important to us at ITC. We're in a very ambitious learning mode. We're open to collaboration with partners. Please get in touch and you have my email details on this final slide. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, and for uh, your presentation and uh, all COPAC members, I'm sure, are very happy to have uh, ITC join. Uh, uh, building international networks, building business networks, these are the kind of issues that uh, will uh, make cooperatives uh, move closer towards fulfilling their potential. And uh, capacity building for cooperatives uh, is an important issue that you note, an important issue that uh, member states note in the General Assembly resolution always. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Anne. Uh, this ends the institutional part of our morning or afternoon or evening. And now we'll move to experiences from the field. We have uh, over uh, 100 participants in this uh, webinar, so I'm sure there are lots of questions uh, uh, coming in. So um, I cannot see the questions, but um, I'm sure Georgia will remind us of all the questions uh, either now or at the end of our webinar. So uh, from me, over to you, Georgia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thanks to everyone for uh, joining this meeting today. Thanks to the audience for uh, the, the questions, actually, that they have put, have been put already in the questions and answers box, which you can see like uh, in, the, in the bottom of, uh, of your screen. Please feel free to address any questions to the speakers. And at the end of this session of the second segment, actually, we will open the floor for further questions so our speakers can get back to you. Um, I want also to, to thank you, Andrew, for the facilitation, but also the speakers that they have addressed so far. Uh, I think that it is very clear, uh, the fact that we are having a common clear path, I would say, in advancing the role of cooperatives for the next even decade, I would say, for a more resilient future. But there cannot be for sure effective advocacy without grasping the needs from cooperators in the field. I think that many of the speakers already, they have already mentioned that we want to make a difference on the ground and that we want like to listen from the people that they experience uh, challenges or they have specific needs from the floor. So this is the intention and the objective of this second segment uh, of our discussion today. Uh, and I will start actually with uh, a specific case study from the region of Africa, from the country of Uganda. Um, actually, the focus will be on gender because as far as we have all experienced and witnessed the, the last period during the pandemic, women's rights violations have been exacerbated. And I think that we would all agree that there is a great need for all development stakeholders including, of course, cooperatives at all levels, to start integrating a gender transformative approach in our actions and strategies. This is what we will hear uh, from our colleague, Mrs. Jacqueline Adios, from the country of Uganda, from, pardon my pronunciation, but I will give it a try, Bumwawule Group from Elgon Community Health Cooperative Limited, Jacqueline, uh, the floor is yours. You can unmute yourself, please. Jacqueline, we, you can start. We can, I think we have the sound. Thank you. Okay, thank you, please. My name is Jacqueline Adisa, a primary teacher by training, a farmer and a member of Elgon Community Health Cooperative and of Maori Women's Village Savings and Loans Association in Eastern Uganda. Our group leader, Oliver Namataka, is here with me, introduced to us the idea of joining a health cooperative in March 2020 when the COVID 19 pandemic had just begun. We did not know how the cooperative, how the health cooperative works, but what was obvious were the many health related challenges we faced. 
poor quality of healthcare in public facilities that is inadequate staffing, drug stock outs, which push people to seeking care in private facilities, but often the cost is high, which we could not afford, and this led to delay in seeking care due to lack of money. We have such an economic impacts COVID-19 has had on our activities. COVID-19 has had a lot of effects on our work, but also on the lives of all our members. Due to lockdown, access to care was limited due to lack of transport to access hospitals. Fear to get infected, but also health facilities were overwhelmed due to a focus on COVID care and some other diseases were ignored. Mothers could not access antenatal care and reaching hospitals for delivery was also difficult. Socially, our children have missed school and the number of teenage pregnancies went up. Women and some men suffered domestic violence. The economic impact of COVID-19 affected incomes and therefore survival became difficult for those who survived on hand to mouth. The cost of food went high and many families could not afford a proper diet while others survived on one meal a day. We have the challenges we have encountered due to the COVID-19 pandemic and what measures and solutions we have taken in response. Some of the challenges include inability to meet as a group, but this was solved by our group chairperson, Oliver, and other group leader, leaders working with the Divine Health Center staff to mobilize us house to house. We learned that joining the Health Cooperative would enable us access health care at a lower rate and on time. This would in turn keep us healthier with our family members and be able to save some money for the family needs. Now, how the measures and actions we have taken contributed to addressing gender inequalities and the positive impacts they have created for, the, or for local communities the gender inequalities we addressed through the family approach in the health cooperatives work. Each member joins with the family and this ensures all family members, including women and men, were covered by health insurance and could access care. Throughout this pandemic, we've learned, we have been able to address and overcome the health and economic challenges as members of Gumaure Women's Group, but also as the entire Elgon co Cooperative. Through our weekly savings in our group, we are able to set aside premium contributions, get some money for other family needs, and women are not depending on their husbands for all the family needs. Now the recommendations I have for cooperatives at all levels to facilitate a just recovery from the pandemic. There are cooperatives and associations that have been weakened due to the pandemic. I recommend that they should reorganize and remobilize members to hear our thoughts on how they can be actively engaged again. It is important for cooperatives to provide education, training, information dissemination, because our cooperative members are better protected than when alone. Although our cooperative has managed to start and run without external support. A lot of support from funding ages is to build capacity for sustainability is needed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jacqueline, for, uh, for your very interesting, I would say, experience from the field. 
I think that all the colleagues around the table, they do agree with the fact that uh, a, a big issue of gender inequalities has been access to care, so especially for women. So we thank you very much for all the work that has been done through the Elgon Community Cooperative in, in Uganda. Uh, and we really take good note of your recommendations. I would like to just echo a couple of the things that you have already mentioned that access to care and the coverage of other family needs, but also the economic independence of women, uh, they give them this kind of tools uh, in order to, um, uh, let's say, overcome several inequalities uh, within their own community, but also within their family. So thanks for all the work that has been done on, on the ground. And from the gender focus, I will pass to, to the youth, uh, but to the youth and climate action. Uh, for this very reason, many times we are thinking about how we will rebuild better, but many times we are not thinking about the future players and the future players, they are the people uh, that they are young and that they are the people that they have the energy to do so. We have seen around the world many times um, that young have taken the opportunity, young people, they have taken the opportunity to build cooperatives and take action uh, towards the climate crisis that we are all facing. And it has been really linked to the pandemic. Uh, on this, I would welcome Mrs. Uh, Dulcem. Uh, sorry again, like for the for the pronunciation, but Mrs. Dulce Bustamante uh, from Philippines, who is representing the Young Entrepreneurs Cooperative, and she is also one of the chairpersons within uh, the Young uh, Network uh, of Cooperatives in the Asia Pacific region. For her, we will innovate a little bit more, although we have her physically online, I would say, so she can take further questions from you. But Dulce has shared with us uh, her video presentation, which we will display in a couple of minutes. Thank you very much, Dulce. Uh, I th yeah, now it's running. Perfect. Uh, Andre, uh, Andre, we have no sound. Maybe I can I can share my my screen, let's see. So as a member of the International Cooperative Alliance. Good day, everyone. So as a member of the International Cooperative Alliance Comedian Cooperation, I am here to represent no. the technologies <laughs> suffering today. And trying no to worries. fix it now. Uh, let's see, share. Can you please tell me if you can see it? Yes. We can see it. Yeah, perfect. What the one? So as a member of the International Cooperative Alliance, we can... Does the sound work? Yes, I see yep. your face. Super, thank you. Operation. I am here to represent uh, our organization and talk about the youth, environment, and cooperatives. So first, let's talk about the Go Green campaign. So this campaign is, uh, you know, last year we did it uh, with the team, The World Goes Green with Africa, America, and Asia Pacific. And this is a really program to help us uh, achieve SDG 13 by 2030. So the ICYC plays an important role here through uh, giving technical assistance, providing programs, and engaging different youth cooperatives from around Asia and Pacific to participate and help us achieve SDG 13. 
One of the programs that we are doing for the Google Green Campaign is tree planting activity. So as you can see in this example, this is done in partnership with three organizations, the Rotary Club of Emo, and this is based here in the Philippines, the Rotary Club of Emos and Young Entrepreneurs are cooperative which I represent as well. So 70 saplings were planted along a road of, uh, full of rice fields. So we are converting this one into a park. So we're helping the community building it. So uh, uh, another activity that we did uh, during the pandemic is a webinar on sustainable living and urban gardening. So our audience were all youth operators. First, and uh, we invited uh, Mr. Asan Ali Kapoor, uh, the chairperson of ICYC, to speak before for us, and also uh, Dr. Emmanuel Sanchagel from the cooperatives, which is a government agency here in the Philippines. And then this is the highlight of my presentation for today. I yeah, the, there, is, to, there is a small uh, delay. I'll give information about this activity that we are doing. This is called uh, Echo of Operativa Sa Escuela, or in English, we translate this into Echo Savers Program. So Echo uh, coming from the words uh, environment and cooperative. So we kind of mix up the words to, to have a catchy title for this program uh, for the youth. So started uh, way back 2018. This program is done in partnership with the cooperatives, with the Department of Education, and of course, with the student cooperatives. So here in our locality here in the Philippines, our community alone has four thousand members of student cooperatives who are very active in their uh, membership in their mother co uh, cooperatives. So uh, we have a group growing issue in our environment here. And I think uh, everyone can relate to this. This is all about waste, segregation, and collecting of a different recyclable materials. So what did we do to resolve this one? So the program works this way. The students uh, who are members of this uh, student cooperative, they will collect recyclable materials. Uh, papers, uh -oh. can, uh, uh, PET bottles, whatever there is that it is recyclable, surrender it to the environmental department of our local government. And then they will in turn convert this into the cash equivalent of those recyclable materials. And the money, which is its cash equivalent, will automatically be deposited to the savings account of the student in their respective cooperatives. So let's say, for example, a student collects one kilogram of papers per week. This one kilogram of paper costs like $2. This $2 will not, not be handed uh, personally to the student. Rather, it will be deposited by the government to their savings account with their respective cooperative. So we are teaching them how to be financially literate. At the same time, we are teaching them how to save
Yeah, I see. I see. We have like a small technical issue uh, here. Yeah, right. so, so here in uh, uh, the Andrea, if you yeah, so really sorry for this. Uh, sorry, uh, Dulce. I saw that you already wrote also uh, on the on the chat uh, that we can share, of course, the video uh, with the mm -hmm. colleagues. Uh, but if you would like to, you know, like to to take the chance and share some more information like from there on from your presentation that would be really lovely okay. apologies to everyone from this technical hiccup uh, really sorry okay uh, no no problem no problem with that uh, i'll post the uh, google drive link later so that any uh, everyone can enjoy the video i would like to continue from where the video stopped i think this is uh the part where you really wanted me to share. So I think I can share my screen. So this is my presentation. Uh, let's go with this one. Can you see my video? Can you see it? Yeah, perfect. Okay. So this one, uh, this is what we call uh, eco cooperativa sa escuela. So this is a uh, Filipino word. So uh, it literally translates to uh, eco-operative in schools. We call this one Echo Savers Program here in the Philippines. Uh, the word echo, we can uh, we kind of mix up the words environment and cooperative. So it goes like that. This is done uh, in partnership with uh, the cooperative office. Uh, a, a, it's an agency under the government. Uh, the Department of Education, of course, they handle the schools here in our community. And another agency, which is the Environment and Natural Resources Office. So we are thinking of a way on how to, uh, how to deal with SDG 13 using uh, the cooperative force, the youth force, and of course, the local government unit. So this one is being participated. Uh, it's in our community alone. We're just one city here in the Philippines. Uh, we have 40,000 people who are uh, children, rather, who are member of student cooperatives. So they have their own uh, mother cooperatives where they belong. So when I talk about student cooperatives here in the Philippines, they are under the age of 18 years old. So they can stand on their own. Uh, they still cannot build an independent cooperative. That's why there is a guardian or a mother cooperative that uh, takes care of these uh, students. So this program started uh, way back 2018 to help resolve the growing issue in our community, which is uh, waste segregation. So as you can see, 40,000 people are just children belonging to the cooperative. So what more if we combine the total population of everyone in this city? So uh, what we did, uh, this is how the program works, the Echo Savers program. Uh, those 40,000 students, they have uh, the will to collect recyclable materials such as papers, PET bottles, uh, other used materials that can be recycled or transformed into another material. They will surrender uh, the, the things that they collected to the local government unit. So in return, uh, the local government unit will convert it into its cash equivalent. Uh, to clear things, let's say, for example, a uh, student collected one kilogram of paper, and upon conversion, this one kilogram of paper uh, will have a $2 equivalent, US dollars equivalent. So this $2 will not be given personally to the student, but will then be transferred to their uh, savings account in their cooperative. So the recyclable materials that they gathered will now be converted into money. So uh, they help the environment, they, they help clean the environment, recycle the materials, collected waste. In return, they have their own money in their savings account, which they can use later on when they grow up. So over 20 schools are participating in this activity. And uh, each school is collecting uh, 150 to a maximum of 1,800 kilograms of waste. So that's just per school. So we will still multiply this uh, uh, weight into 20 schools. So that's how big this uh, program is helping uh, the city government. And of course, the environment as well in reducing and uh, recycling the waste. 
So lastly, uh, of course, my role here is to interconnect youth, the cooperative, the ICA, of course, the movement, and SDG 13. So we all know that every cooperative in every part of the world has what we call a community development fund. It is uh, what we call here in the Philippines, or that fund that is allotted for us cooperatives to do certain community projects to help our uh, own community where we belong. So uh, if each of the cooperative that we have right now will allot, uh, not wholly, but uh, maybe a certain portion of it, your community development fund, to help the ICA, the ICYC here in Asia Pacific, be our partner in Go Green Campaign and uh, do environmentally uh, related projects, it, it will be a big help in uh, alleviating the problem that we have with climate change. And uh, with that, we all know that the youth of the day is really the driving force and the major implementer of every campaign that there is in the world. Be it about climate change, be it about environment, poverty, economy, and other uh, crisis or SDG that there is, the youth really has a big role to play. Because as what uh, they have said earlier, Georgia mentioned earlier, that we must not forget that uh, the future, of course, will rely upon how we, uh, you know, how we relay our problem to the youth because they will really uh, benefit from it. If not benefit, you know, worse comes to worse, they will be the one to suffer from what we are doing right now. So we hope for that not to happen. So uh, as we have still time today, let us help in spreading environmentalism and youth cooperativism to our, uh, you know, to everyone in our community. So I think that's it. I need to keep it short and simple so you can absorb all the information that there is. Uh, again, I will still share my presentation through the chat box. And uh, if you want to know further about pro uh, the programs that I've tackled and uh, maybe connect with ICA in the Asia Pacific, uh, you can email me. My information is here. And uh, my WhatsApp or Viber is also posted, my number. So uh, thank you, Georgia and Andrea, for this opportunity for me having uh, be a representative of the IC Life. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, Dulce, for the beautiful presentation, but also for the, the great and inspiring energy that you brought on in our panel. Uh, today, I think that uh, all colleagues uh, would excuse us for going a little bit beyond time, but I think that is really crucial, of course, to, to hear from the colleagues uh, from, uh, from the different regions and the different countries around the world that they enjoy cooperativism, as uh, Dulce has already mentioned, but also to learn from each other. Um, an important part that Dulce has already raised through her presentation, it has been the collaboration with the local authorities in her case, with the different schools, but also with the networks, uh, including ICA and the Youth Cooperative Network. Um, partnerships are really important and the capacity of networks is even more important, I would say. And the strategies that we want the role of cooperatives to be further acknowledged, it needs also to be somehow implemented. So we see the practice also on the floor. And how we do this, we do this through programming. And now we have a case study from the region of um, the from the region of the Americas. Really sorry, from the country of uh, Costa Rica. So we will have the opportunity today to host um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Carlos Leiton, who is the director of uh, Cope Parazu. Uh, I'm really sorry for the pronunciation to, to all participants. I hope I, I, it went well. Um, who will be presenting actually uh, Casa uh, de la Alegría, which is a project that it is done in cooperation uh, with our regional office, Cooperatives of the Americas, whom we would like to thank as well for the facilitation. And it is a project that is actually aiming to facilitate employment towards migrants. Without uh, any further delay, I will give the floor to Mr. Leighton. Um, Senor Carlos, the floor is yours. Just before he starts, because I will uh, display his presentation, I would like to inform those that they need to use interpretation that there is a small globe 
on the bottom of the Zoom channel, so you can click on it in case there is like some uh, Spanish intervention. Thank you. And I will, Andrea, you will share the presentation, please, maybe. Okay. Thank you, Georgian. And it's a pleasure for me to share with you, all of you, um, this, this morning, it's seven o'clock in the morning here in Costa Rica. Um, uh, it, it has been a, a great pleasure for us and an honor to be invited to this to this forum. Uh, first, I would like to, to we're going to talk about Proyecto Casa de la Alegría, which is a, a project we started about about four years ago. But uh, um, please go on in the presentation. Uh, we're going to present a little bit about the Copa Zoo. What what are we? Okay, uh, Cope Tarazú. We, we are, Cope Tarazú is, is a region, it's a coffee region in Costa Rica, and you can see in, in the map, it's, it's a little bit south of the Central Valley in Costa Rica. We are about an uh, hour and a half from, from the Central Valley, from San Jose, which is the main, the main capital of, of, of main city of Costa Rica. It's up in the mountains, it's a, it's a, it's a coffee region. Um, is uh, very well known around the world because of the quality of coffee. We have a population of about 4,000 people uh, living in the region. And every harvest, during the harvest, that is mainly between uh, November and February, about 25,000 migrant workers arrive to the region. Most of the migrants are from Nicaragua, northern Nicaragua, or uh, indigenous from Panama that uh, comes to, to pick the coffee here in the region. The, our region, Tarazú region, uh, produce about 42% of the national crop in Costa Rica. Next. Okay, Cope Tarazú. Uh, Cope Tarazú uh, was founded in 1960 by a very small coffee farmer. At that time, 228 uh, small coffee farmers joined, made a, a established a co-op. And now we are close to 4,600 members. Uh, about a third of that of women that are, are members of the co-op. And most of them are small coffee farmers. 85% has less than four hectares. Uh, and we have a milling capacity of 325,000 uh, quintals or bags that uh, is uh, make Copa uh, the largest coffee mill in, in Costa Rica at this moment. Besides coffee, we do other activities. We, we provide a uh, commercial services to the members of the co-op. That means that they can get uh, uh, at the co-op all the farm inputs, all the needs that they need for, 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 for home. They receive technical assistance, they, they receive financial support. And also we have a department of, of research and, and, and development uh, at the co-op. Okay, Paolo, next one. Next. Okay, uh, Casa de la Alegría, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, this is a project I say we start in, in 19, uh, 20, 2018, that's about four years ago. Uh, next one, please. Um, uh, it's mainly focused on the social aspect of the, of the sustainable development. It's, uh, it's a project that is very, very close to the, I would say to the, first uh, the real base of the, of the development um, because it's mainly small farmers coffee pickers and their kids uh, we are trying to take good care of the kids of the coffee uh, coffee pickers because during the crop when most of the of the of the migrants come with their family that's very common that uh, they come with the family to the region and so if, if they don't have a place where to leave the, the kids, they will take them to the plantations or they will leave them in, in a house, uh, maybe many kids taken care by just one person. So the Casa de la Regia is, is, is a project to, to take care of the kid under 12 when the parents are in the uh, picking the coffee. In, 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 that, in the house, Casa de la Alegría, we call it, they will receive a comprehensive care there by training personnel. They will receive good feeding, uh, educational activities. Uh, we will take care of the kids during the during the, the whole day from six o'clock to six in the evening. Uh, by by personnel are trained to to do that. Next. 
Okay, the, the goal of Casa de la Guía is to achieve the eradication of child labor, forced labor, or child abuse in our region. Uh, we have been uh, growing uh, about five houses per year. In the past, as I was saying before, um, most of those kids were taken to the coffee plantation during the day. And, and, and there, is, there, there, is not, there are no conditions for them to be on the, on the coffee plantation. So the idea is they will stay in a safe place and also the idea is to go to keep growing in this in this project. Um, uh, we have been helping the people around Tarazum in that allow us to show this action assure the good children protection that in other time we're very exposed to risk. We are very very concerned about the the the, the child's health, the child situation during the crop because i say many many kids come with their, with their parents during the crop and, and it's a very difficult situation so casa de la will provide the, the secureness for for this for these kids next one okay uh, we start in 2018 at uh, that time we have one house with 45 kids next year in 2019 we have four houses uh with 200 kids Last year, 2020 was nine houses, but only five did operate and only 45 kids. And that's mainly because of the pandemic. Uh, we were not allowed to, to have many kids at the, at, the, at the Casa de la Alegría. And also, uh, most there was, there was no permission for the pickers to bring their, their kids to Costa Rica. They have to go across the border and there was no permission for the coffee picker to bring their kids so that's why we have a, a many a less less houses and less, less kids this crop uh we're going to start in november we hope to gonna have 14 houses operating uh and next year we're going to have 19 houses that's uh, the goal that we have up to up to now um I, something very interesting is that we have been able to to build or to to uh, prepare this this Casa de la Alegría with the participation of the local communities because it will be very very expensive to build houses around the around the farms but uh, we have been using facilities that the communities already have in the, in the communities so they can uh, uh, we will uh, refurnish the the, the 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 facilities make them available to to be used during the crop so it's, it's a it's a, an alliance also with the with the with the community using their own their own facilities and that's that's uh, the project we have up to now also uh, last year and uh, during the the, the pandemic uh, with support with the with the uh, international co-ops alliance uh, with the european union we were able to develop materials to to prevent the, um, the, the, um, the, the COVID cases in the region. We invest a lot of time, a lot of resort, uh, teaching the, the farmers, teaching the, the neighbors, uh, all the workers at the co-op. And then when the uh, pickers arrive, teaching them how to, how to do the right uh, protocols to prevent diseases. And that was very, <clears throat> important because even though we have those 20, 20 more thousand coffee pigs coming to the region, we didn't have many cases. Uh, and that was because the prevention was, was done very, very good uh, with the support of Cope Terrazu and the uh, International Cooperative Alliance and the European Union. Okay, next. Um, I would say that Casa de la Ria is a real answer for a decent work according to international standards. Uh, and, and we are we are certified also fair trade. So we have to be able to comply with all the, the, the parameters and requirements that certification has. And one of the, the main concerns is, is, uh, is the, the, the child situation in the, in the crop. Uh, we also see this type of project is a must to be developed in the agricultural activities with the support from the government and other institutions to improve the quality of life of the migrant worker in their families. As I say at the beginning, this is the, the migrant workers, uh, their family is this where the, all the, the, the 
rural activities starts. That's where we have to really focus and making sure that we have a, 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 a quite an impact in the in the life of these uh, uh, workers and especially in the life of their kids. Uh, uh, the support of the international institutions like uh, ILO, FAO, Cooperative America, you know, they will be critical to replicate and, and discourage this project in other parts of, of, uh, of the world. Uh, organizations like Cooperative Azul, there are thousand organizations in, in Latin America and Africa and Asia. And I think that we can be, we can be the, the local tools to, to make sure that this, this support from this organization really have an, an, an impact in, in, in the families that we, we receive as a worker in the region. Okay, that will be my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Senor Carlos, uh, for the insightful, I would say, case study from uh, Costa Rica. Uh, it shows clearly the, the impact uh, that cooperatives can create uh, in, in the local community, I would say, and how uh, a case study like yours can create further links uh, for policy dialogue, I would say, with further institutions such as the ILO, FAO, but also the, the European Union, as uh, it is a project funded by the European delegation of uh, Costa Rica. Uh, I would like to, to emphasize actually um, your work uh, on the elimination of uh, child labor as it has been uh, for the ILO, the international year uh, for the elimination of child labor. And this is uh, where uh, ICA and its cooperative members, I would say, and cooperatives across the world, they, they do stand. Uh, and thank you for all the work that you have been doing towards uh, uh, this area. I have seen also uh, that uh, many of the speakers, they have started already uh, addressing the questions from the audience through the Q&A box. And I thank you very much for this because we are running already late and I don't want to, to delay any further the, the audience from the other side events uh, that they are taking place within the HLTF uh, framework. Um, from my side, I would like to, to close here the second segment and uh, thanks the, thank the colleagues that they addressed already uh, questions. We will try to address as many as possible through email, so sorry for those that they have not been addressed yet. And without any further delay, I will pass for the closing remarks to Mr. Rowlands, who is the Director General of the ICA to share with us uh, some uh, closing points as the COPAC chair uh, for this year. Bruno, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Georgia. And I would like first to thank you all the speakers for uh, the excellent presentations you've given. And also I want to thank you all of you to be here and to share this very important moment with us. So just to wrap up this meeting um, uh, of this, uh, Committee, UN Committee of the Promotion on, the, on Cooperatives, COPAC, just a few key points uh, I would like to highlight. We've heard, first of all, uh, of first keynote speakers from the UN and from uh, Mongolia, speaking in the name of a huge uh, um, system, the U European Union, and from a state, Mongolia, uh, highlighting the importance of cooperatives in uh, their own uh, geographical space and in uh, for their own organizations. First of all, the uh, European Union representative, Mrs. Marlene Holzer, was uh, highlighting the importance of uh, cooperatives um, and their proven re record. So it's based on a proven record of stable, stable employment. And uh, so the employment being seen as one of the key uh, bases for development. She also mentioned the issue of SME promotion and the issue of the global model, the business model of cooperatives, which is at the root of their uh, resilience and their success. <clears throat> We've heard the representative uh, of Mongolia, Mr. Uh, Yadam Suren, mentioning the, um, and being a witness of the importance of cooperatives in his country and uh, highlighting the importance of member states of the UN to promote cooperatives uh, and to have uh, uh, the, the best possible legal and policy framework for cooperatives. We've heard Ms. Anna Biondi from the ILO speaking about the formalization of informal 
the economy and the importance of cooperative in this uh, framework. She reminded us that next year there will be the 20 years since the recommendation 193 on the promotion of cooperatives, which remains the basic policy text at the international level and which also enshrines the characteristics of cooperatives. She also mentioned the issue of social dialogue and the importance for cooperatives to be involved in the social dialogue at any level because uh, they are needed to discuss the issues like social protection, national development. And so the, uh, the especially in this moment of this uh, new restart with COVID and uh, the cooperatives, uh, as she said, are, should be at the center of this reflection. We've heard from uh, Guillermo Bradi from the FAO talking about the relevance of agricultural cooperatives and the strong impact they've had, and in particular in this COVID period. And uh, she, has, she mentioned also how bad the COVID uh, crisis has been, especially for small farmers, but also that co-ops have been catalyzers, catalyzers in social protection schemes, information, linking producers and consumers, technology, and so on. He mentioned also the decade of family farming, and here I want to emphasize the fact that uh, cooperatives and family farming go together. Uh, most cooperatives, most agricultural cooperatives are cooperatives or small uh, family producers. So that goes hand in hand. And cooperatives, as he mentioned, the agricultural cooperatives are the majority of cooperatives today. So they are very, very important. Nazik Beshen Ali um, spoke uh, in the name of the ICA about a study which uh, the ICA is conducting in this moment on the contribution of cooperatives to the SDGs. And she mentioned the issue of access, income generation, inclusion, environment protection, which are absolutely key and uh, to the SDGs. And, of, and also mentioning that cooperatives as a whole cover all 17 SDGs. And uh, the study uh, shows that uh, there is a need to emphasize education, statistics, and the, a, place, a, a stronger place for cooperatives and cooperative organizations in the development policies and programs. And so uh, the, this conceptual framework that uh, the IEC is trying to develop through this SDG study will be very important in order to better uh, reflect the importance of cooperatives in the, uh, in the framework of the SDGs. We've heard from Anne Chapas talking about uh, the business support organizations and also saying that cooperatives are important because they are both businesses and they are also business support organizations. They have these two dimensions. And uh, they also, uh, she also mentioned the strength of cooperatives, but also some weaknesses which we have to look at. And I think this is very, very, very important indeed. She mentioned that cooperative cooperatives have a multiplier effect. And I, re I think this is extremely important to mention. We've had those uh, th three, um, three um, examples from the field. And these three examples are really emblematic. They show us the resilience of cooperatives. Uh, they show us also the, uh, the mutual benefit between, uh, let's say, the various stakeholders in, uh, in, in, those, um, in those examples. Some are old, uh, one, one is old, uh, the one of Costa Rica, and I had the chance to visit Cooperative Tarasu. Some are, are, are newer and are younger. And uh, so they focus these examples on health, environment, international cooperation, child labor, uh, the fight against child labor, uh, with specific stakeholders like the, the youth, the women, uh, immigrants. So these are key stakeholders. So they show us also the importance of cooperatives for key stakeholders. These examples are uh, very important in themselves. They're excellent ones, but they could be seen as anecdotal best practices if we did not take into account that around the world you have 3 million cooperatives, uh, over 1 billion cooperative members, and 10%, uh, almost 10% of world uh, of the world employed population. So these scales are enormous. You have to take these scales into account when you talk about cooperatives. And the, incovering, the incoming sorry, recovery period that uh, is coming now will have to face the strong linkages that exist between public health, uh, environment, economic inequality, social exclusion. 
And this also follows the linkages that exist between the 17 SDGs. So we are just going to, uh, let's say, in the sense of the 17 SDGs by looking at the linkages between these dimensions. And in this perspective, the COP is long-term economic resilience and long-term contribution to sustainable development, uh, which is in fact is due to their single business model they have all over the world, um, and which is based on people's needs and on democratic control makes them a very important actor in this recovery. In this sense, cooperative can contribute very importantly to the new global social contract, which is now needed. And as the UN Secretary General himself rightly said, that cooperatives uh, which invest in people, the planet and reduce inequalities, they should be one of the actors in this new social contract and should be uh, seen as part of it. And as part of it, they should be listened to, including what they will report uh, on, on, let's say, on, uh, on their impact on the territories, and also uh, on the corresponding public policies and corresponding legislation, which they need in order to improve their contribution to this recovery and to uh, sustainable development, which goes beyond the recovery. So thank you to all of you to, for being here. Thank you to all our speakers. Uh, I really learned a lot during this, uh, this meeting. Georgia, the floor is back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bruno. Uh, and I think that uh, it is time for, for us to close this, uh, this beautiful discussion. I would say that uh, we have learned a lot. Uh, I think that you, you summarized it really, really well. Uh, so basically, uh, last thank you to, to all panelists, but also to the audience that they remained already 30 minutes beyond the, the time that uh, we have uh, planned. So on behalf of the Committee for the Promotion and Investment of Cooperatives, COPAC, and all its members, I would like to, to thank you all for your contributions. And we will remain uh, in touch with all of you for any questions, you know where to reach us as well as you will receive all the material, as we mentioned already in the chat, uh, within the coming days throughout the COPAC channels and COPAC's members channels. Thank you very, very much. Wishing you a good day, uh, evening and night. Ciao. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Georgia. Thank you, everyone. Have a Thank good you. day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, to all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye.